Hello, I'm Dr. Randall Seacrest, your host for eOrthopod TV. Today, I'll be talking remotely with Dr. David Minch. Dr. Minch practices orthopedic surgery. He's primarily a knee surgeon in New York City. Dr. Minch did his medical school training at New York University. He then completed a residency at the Hospital for Joint Diseases in New York City. From there, he did a sports medicine fellowship with Lars Peterson in Gothenburg, Sweden. I think today what we had talked about uh, uh, discussing is your approach to knee arthroscopy and giving patients a little bit of information about knee arthroscopy from a very general point of view. Um, what I'm interested in talking about, one, is you know, we've been doing knee arthroscopy probably for 30 to 40 years now, and it's become a pretty common um, technique that we use to treat a lot of different joint diseases, and it started primarily in the knee. So I guess we should start out by explaining a little bit about what type of disease processes uh, you would use arthroscopy of the knee to treat. When a patient comes to see you, what's most likely bothering that patient? Well, usually when patients come uh, with their knee problems, it could be a multitude of different situations. Uh, one of the most common indications for arthroscopic surgery of the knee is a meniscus or cartilage tear. However, there could be uh, other problems, problems related to the kneecap, uh, problems related to the articular cartilage, and certainly ligament problems as well. So in terms of symptoms, the primary symptoms is, is a patient would come presenting with knee pain primarily, or perhaps knee swelling, or some feeling that the knee is causing problems, it's catching, it's giving way, something of that sort. Is, is that pretty accurate? Yeah, that, that's pretty accurate. So usually arthroscopic surgery is going to be performed because of pain, uh, mechanical locking, or instability. Uh, and if those problems are persistent uh, despite non-operative approaches, then arthroscopic intervention will be indicated. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit about arthroscopy and sort of the, 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 the way we're using arthroscopy these days and, and what the technique really involves. Um, can you explain in, in ways that a patient could understand what exactly arthroscopy is? What's the equipment used? How is it done? And, and what sort of uh, uh, types of incisions, those sorts of things, are used to perform arthroscopy in this day and age? Sure. So usually uh, arthroscopy is going to be performed in a hospital setting or an outpatient surgical setting. Um, although some surgeons use uh, local anesthesia, uh, in our settings we are usually using a spinal anesthesia or even sometimes a general anesthesia uh, in order to get adequate relaxation and in order to assess uh, all aspects of the knee. Um, the procedure itself will usually take a half hour, give or take a couple of minutes, um, and that is usually for the routine type of arthroscopic procedures, meaning meniscal tears, patella problems, and things like that. Uh, very sophisticated surgical interventions can be done arthroscopically as well uh, for ligament reconstructions like an anterior cruciate ligament reconstruction, which typically takes a little bit longer. But for the routine arthroscopic procedure, uh, as I stated, that takes usually about a half hour or so, give or take. Uh, the surgeon will usually make two or three little nicks around the knee about a millimeter or two long and put a camera inside the knee in order to visualize all the uh, structures of the knee. And that will be seen on a monitor above the patient. Uh, so everything is extremely magnified, and we can really see pathologies that we cannot appreciate on physical examination, x-ray, or MRI. Uh, in addition, uh, through one of those small portals, usually what we call an outflow catheter is put in, where fluid, which is, which is rushing into the knee in order to expand the joint, uh, is drained. And the third portal is usually for some uh, surgical instrument to probe or resect or really to do whatever we need to do. Um, uh, after that, the patient goes into a uh, post-operative recovery phase where they're usually there uh, for an hour or two. Now, I'm assuming that what you're describing is an outpatient procedure. Uh, most, most arthroscopic procedures uh, that, that I see done these days are, are normally outpatient procedures that you don't need to stay overnight in the hospital. Is, is that still pretty much the norm? Yes, I would say uh, over 95% of our procedures are outpatient procedures. 
Um, so typically, even with uh, uh, major ligament reconstructions, patients do go home the same day. Uh, many times they'll be putting weight on the leg and moving their knee the same day. So uh, almost all patients do go home uh, on the same day as their procedure. Now let's, let's back up a little bit and talk a, a, a bit about the diagnosis and how a patient might prepare uh, to have an arthroscopy. I'm assuming that most of the patients that you see are probably referred to you uh, from other physicians uh, or perhaps make an appointment because they have a problem that they think they need to see an orthopedic surgeon. Um, how do you evaluate that patient and how do you determine whether arthroscopy is the next step for that patient in terms of either diagnosis or treatment of their knee problem? Yeah, as a knee specialist, many times I will be seeing patients who already have had physical therapy. They do come to the office with their x-rays and, M and MRIs and are still complaining of uh, persistent problems. Uh, having said that, um, if a patient is complaining of pain, which is the usual situation for a patient to come to our office, I will back up and see exactly uh, how their physical therapy was performed, what exercises were done, because uh, typically uh, we will sort of modify the program depending upon uh, the pathology that the patient has. Uh, many times we can try to avoid surgical intervention as long as we can get an understanding of what the patient's needs and desires are. And uh, there are many patients who have meniscus or cartilage tears, but if they're asymptomatic, they are not going to need surgical intervention. So it's a matter of understanding uh, the patient's pain and their goals, but if the patient cannot achieve their goals despite an adequate non-operative approach, uh, that's when arthroscopic intervention will be recommended. You know, it's, it's interesting. When, in, the, in the days um, uh, long gone before we had the MRI scan, I think that, that the arthroscopy was used primarily as a diagnostic tool when it first started. You know, my impression is, is that very rarely do we use arthroscopy anymore as a purely diagnostic tool. That normally when, when we as orthopedic surgeons are going into the knee, we're going in with a pretty good idea of, of what's going on and what we need to do inside that knee. Is that accurate? Is that the way you see arthroscopy these days? Yes, I, I think uh, by time we're in the operating room, we should have a very good idea uh, of what the pathology is and that it is a surgical treated pathology uh, with a good outcome expected. Uh, having said that, uh, it is not all that unusual to see things um, like uh, inflammation or articular cartilage injuries, which are uh, injuries to the covering of the joint, uh, that may be there, that may not be picked up on an MRI. However, MRIs are even getting better and better in that regard, and certainly as time goes on, uh, I think there's going to be very few surprises uh, going in arthroscopically that we did not know uh, up front. And how do, you, how, how do you deal with patients when when you're trying to get them prepared for arthroscopic surgery, what do you tell them um, that they might want to expect uh, during surgery and after surgery in terms of maybe changing the plan? I'm assuming that you make sure they understand that if you see something in the knee that needs to be dealt with and it makes sense to deal with it at the time, you're going to go ahead and do that uh, during the arthroscopy. Uh, th that's true. So, I mean, uh, if there's something that uh, needs a little tweak, if there's something that, uh, if there's some inflammation that has to be removed, uh, if there's a rough spot on the articular cartilage that wasn't expected that needs to be smoothed down, um, we do explain that to the patient that I'm going to do what I need to do in order to get the patient that best possible result in that uh, situation. Um, I, th I think one of the main things though is when we talk to patients about arthroscopy, I also try to tell them that this is not magical surgery that you know, they're going to have a half hour procedure, they're going to be in and out of the hospital the same day, and then you know, in next week they're going to be running the marathon. So I tell them that usually they're going to be on a cane for about a week or so. Uh, it could be a lot less uh, depending upon uh, what physical um, situation they are in going into the surgery and the amount of pathology that's treated at the time of the surgery. But typically it takes a couple of weeks for patients to come to themselves and again, depending upon the pathology, it could take a lot longer until they get the final, final result, uh, which I try to explain to the patient as a result where they forget that they've had surgery done and you know, they're well on their way. Now, 
Do you have any other uh, precautions that you sort of routinely will give patients in that as they leave the outpatient surgery center in terms of uh, maybe showering, any sort of problems with medications? Do you have a set protocol that you would give a patient uh, that's just gone through arthroscopy? So for routine arthroscopic uh, surgical procedures, uh, like a partial meniscectomy where we will remove part of a torn cartilage or smoothing down the articular cartilage. Um, for those types of procedures, there's very few restrictions post-op. Uh, the, the patient will be in a relatively large dressing, uh, usually from the upper thigh down to the ankle. Uh, we typically will have that on for two days uh, and the patient will remove that after 48 hours. Uh, at that point in time, I will have the patient shower. I tell them to let the water and soap just run on the knee, and then they pat dry the two or three little incisions that they have, and then uh, just simply put Band-Aids over the incision sites. Uh, they should try to ice the knee as best they can in the thick dressing, uh, but that's sometimes a little bit difficult with the dressing being so thick in the first 48 hours. But after that, icing the knee 20 minutes, two or three times a day is recommended. From the very get-go, we encourage patients uh, with those types of surgical interventions to move their knee right away and to put weight on the leg as they can tolerate. Uh, we don't want them put to push through pain, but on the other hand, early weight bearing, early range of motion will really enhance the patient's recovery. Well, I think a lot of patients are concerned about certain things. One is you mentioned uh, when they can shower, when to take the dressing off. One thing I think patients are always going to want to know is, is how much pain they should expect and how they're going to be treated for that pain. Do you routinely send patients or feel the need to send patients home with pain medications? Uh, we routinely do that. Um, we obviously look to see if the patient has any allergies or any concerns. Uh, typically, uh, many patients don't even use those medications, but uh, through these three small little incisions, uh, one can do a lot of surgery, and pain is subjective. So if a patient is going to have significant pain, it's usually not constant, and after 48 hours, it usually does uh, get much less. So uh, a patient may need some pain meds for a little while after the surgery, but typically it would only be for a couple of days, and after that, maybe just use some Tylenol or something like that. Uh, just to get them through. Now, what about, what about anti-inflammatory medications? You know, patients can purchase anti-inflammatory medications over the counter like Nuprin, Advil, those sorts of medications. Uh, do you routinely suggest that patients use those or do you uh, tend to not want them to use those type of medications? I personally uh, hold back on those medications for about 10 days because of a potential bleeding potential. Um, so we really don't want to get uh, bleeding in the knee, which will happen to some degree anyway. So as long as there's no um, problems with taking Tylenol, we'll probably go with that rather than a uh, anti-inflammatory for the first 10 days. And, and that's mainly because of the, the risk of bleeding or it increases the, the amount of bleeding you have because of the, the problems with uh, in, inhibiting the platelets. Potentially correct, yes. Yeah. Now, uh, the other thing that people are going to want to know is, is physical therapy. You know, most of, of patients who, are, who have come to arthroscopy have probably already seen a physical therapist. When should they count on beginning physical therapy again uh, as a part of a rehab program after surgery? So, um, for, again, for the typical uh, arthroscopic procedures, uh, ones in which we're not doing meniscal repair or an anterior cruciate ligament reconstruction, but for the typical ones, uh, we are getting our patients uh, into physical therapy very early. Uh, the key factors for physical therapy in the initial stages is to number one, get increased range of motion. So most patients are probably going to be coming into surgery with relatively good motion. However, they may not have that motion coming out of surgery because of some discomfort and swelling. So range of motion, obtaining full extension and full flexion is key. Uh, the second thing is to use modalities to reduce the swelling. And the third aspect is to uh, increased strength. Uh, patients are, are amazed sometimes on how quickly the quadricep muscle, uh, the muscle on top of the thigh atrophies, uh, and a good portion of therapy is to not only strengthen that muscle, but really all the muscles around the knee and on both lower extremities. 
so, so I assume that you, you're in favor of patients seeing a physical therapist fairly quickly, within a few days of arthroscopy, and, and not wait for two weeks before, before they begin to actually engage in formal physical therapy. Well, yes. I mean, they could be engaging in formal phys They should be doing range of motion, weight-bearing, right same day. Uh, as long as there's no restrictions from the surgeon, um, they should really be trying to achieve that very quickly. However, to help them achieve that, we do send patients to formal physical therapy because sometimes and many times it's difficult for a patient to get full motion by themselves um, and also they need to be taught a strengthening program that they can take home and do independently. Now, a couple other questions that, that will routinely come up with patients. One is, is work. Uh, when do you like to see patients be released back to work? D depending obviously on what they do, but what are your guidelines that you like to use with your patients? I mean, it really depends upon the type of work they do. I mean, if they have a desk job, we've had patients go the next day back to work if they could be driven there, you know, get to their desk. Uh, for many of these uh, typical arthroscopies, there's really nothing that the patient can do to hurt what the surgeon did. If they do too much, the patients will be hurting. So uh, if they do too much, they're going to get into more swelling, more pain, loss of motion, and uh, the recovery is going to take longer. So we don't really encourage people to uh, go out there very quickly uh, where they're abusing their knees uh, and getting into some of these situations. However, uh, if a patient can do that, if, they're get, if they have common sense, uh, as far as going back to work to a desktop, desk type of position, um, then we're not going to have a real problem with it. On the other hand, if we have a heavy laborer, uh, an athlete, we really do want to see uh, full range of motion, no effusion, no swelling, and uh, excellent strength. Uh, because otherwise they're going to be a set up for re-injury in that situation and, and we obviously want to avoid that. Well, you know, I think patients are always interested in, in really in how long it's going to take them to get over any type of surgery. So you've mentioned the, the routine types of arthroscopic procedures. Uh, when we go in and just trim out a torn meniscus or perhaps clean up some damaged cartilage that doesn't require uh, a major reconstruction. How long is it in your experience that patients uh, take before they really can get past this surgery and sort of consider this behind them so that they can do all of their recreational activities and pretty much consider themselves back to normal activity? So it certainly depends upon uh, your patient population. Uh, patient population that we see is sort of the recreational athlete in general. You know, professional athletes are going to get back a lot quicker. Um, and uh, they're going to be spending a lot more time with their physical therapist and real incentive to get back as quickly as they can. And again, with most of these surgeries, um, no harm can be done to the surgical procedure once the surgery is done because we're really not waiting for any biological response. So uh, we don't cookbook or recovery times or recovery periods or, or treatment regimens. It really depends upon how the patient is progressing. So we don't say, you know, at one week we want your range of motion to be 90 degrees and then, you know, two weeks 120. Uh, we'll progress the patients as quickly uh, as they can. In this patient population, uh, in general, you're probably looking at four to six weeks um, for patients to feel pretty good. Uh, I'm sure patients have heard, oh, they, somebody ran the marathon at two weeks, you know, why can't I do that? But again, I, I'd much rather, uh, again, depict the surgery uh, as not magical surgery, getting back super quickly, and certainly there are patients who will be getting back that quickly. But for the, the average patient who's undergoing this procedure, it's going to take about four to six weeks for them to feel really pretty, pretty good. Uh, there are certainly patients who within a day or two recognize that their preoperative pain is gone or very, very different. Um, and it can take up to three months before the patient actually forgets uh, that they had a surgical intervention done. Um, so I think that is more of a typical, real scenario, and I think it's important for patients to understand that. Now, we've, we've talked a little bit about when patients start physical therapy and, and sort of what they should do in the post-op phase. When do you like to see those patients back in the office? I mean, when are they going to come back for an office appointment and perhaps uh, have their sutures removed if you've put sutures in or, or b get a checkup for the most part? Yes, I, I will see uh, all the patients back one week post-op. Uh, I, I will just want to make sure what their range of motion is, 
Uh, if they are having a lot of swelling in the knee, uh, make sure there's no signs of any superficial or deep infection, uh, and really be able to dictate at that point specifically what therapy uh, in a formal way we're going to go with. Um, and then uh, typically after that, we'll see them four to six weeks after that, uh, and many times that, that should be it. Now, we probably should move on because patients are always, and physicians to that matter, uh, are always uh, interested in understanding what sorts of things they should be watching for, and, and in some cases, what complications can occur, what can go wrong from, from a, a relatively simple procedure like arthroscopy. So I think we probably ought to spend a few minutes talking about th the potential complications of arthroscopy, both at the time of surgery and then potential complications down the road as the patient recovers. So let's, let's begin with, with things that you worry about as a surgeon that could go wrong during the surgery. I mean, really, uh, with this type of surgical intervention, uh, complications in the OR are really few and far between. Uh, the biggest concern in the OR is obviously going to be an anesthesia risk or an anesthesia complication, which again, in my experience over 25 years, has been extraordinarily rare. Um, other things that could go wrong uh, in the operating room itself um, is uh, usually technique related. So uh, in a surgeon who is not very well experienced, there could be potential complications uh, as far as technique is concerned uh, with roughing up surfaces and things like that. But I, I think uh, in today's uh, day and age, most orthopedic surgeons who are doing arthroscopy have a vast experience, and that happens very uh, unusually at this point in time. Uh, instrument breakage, which was a problem, as you stated, 25, 30 years ago, really has not been a problem uh, that I know of over 10, 15 years. So truly, in the operating room, there are minimal, minimal, minimal complications. Um, after surgical intervention, the main concern of any surgeon who does any surgery is the potential of an infection. And I kind of alluded to that, uh, is that that is something that we check on our first office visit. So one could get a superficial infection uh, from the stitches placed, uh, and approximately 1 in 500 to 1 in 1,000 patients could actually get a deep infection in the knee. Um, so we do everything that we can to prevent that type of situation. Uh, it does occur, occur rarely. Uh, and if it occurs, then really uh, one has to jump on that treatment, uh, which for a deep infection usually means a repeat arthroscopic intervention. Uh, for superficial infections, uh, usually that can be treated with antibiotics. Other complications of uh, arthroscopic surgery post-surgical are, are, again, few and far between. Uh, one could get a deep vein thrombosis. Uh, but with the surgery procedure being uh, so short, getting p patients ambulatory very quickly, um, that is relatively rare. And other complications, all probably less than 2% um, that could develop. Uh, so it, the complication rate of the surgery is very, very small, um, while the potential benefit usually is going to be in the 85 to 95% range. Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting. I think you had alluded earlier to the fact that arthroscopic surgery, although it seems so high-tech and it seems so relatively minimally invasive, patients tend to think that it is this magical tool that we have. And I think one of the things that we should probably bring out and, and emphasize, as you've already done, is the fact that some patients may continue to have problems. I mean, we sometimes will do arthroscopic procedures that don't necessarily accomplish all of the, the, the needs for the patient. And that's not necessarily a complication. It's not necessarily a failure of the technique. It just means that perhaps the problem that we're trying to deal with is, is not 100% amenable with the techniques that we're using with arthroscopic surgery and, and may require something else. Yeah, no question. So getting on the same page with the patient, uh, making sure that the patient's expectations are in line with the surgeon's expectations is critical. So uh, a good example is uh, a patient who has a uh, meniscal tear, uh, very sharp pain along the inner aspect of their knee, but they also have stiffness and achiness in their knee, which is due to some uh, minimal arthritis in the knee. So in, in that situation, I think the surgeon can very clearly say that with arthroscopic intervention, 
uh, that the sharp pain is going to get better 90 to 95 percent of the time. But the stiffness and achiness may still remain uh, because we can't cure arthritis arthroscopically. Uh, and if that was the case, then other situations may need to be invoked. Uh, for example, we may want to do a high hyaluronic acid injection at some point uh, in order to try to alleviate some of the symptoms of, uh, of um, achiness in the knee. So I, I think really hearing what the patient's complaints are and for the surgeon to really be able to explain what we can do and probably more importantly what we can't do uh, is most important for everybody to be satisfied when this is all said and done. Yeah, I think that's excellent advice. Uh, I think that, that setting expectations up front, especially with, with something that uh, like arthroscopy that has been touted in the, in the lay press and things is, is really doing wonders. Yeah, we sometimes do pretty good stuff, but we can't cure everything through a quarter inch incision. So I, I think that's a very useful piece of advice for patients. Um, well, as we close here, I think we've covered just about everything that a patient needs to know about uh, arthroscopy of the knee and how they should approach arthroscopy of the knee. Is there anything that you would like for patients to know that we haven't covered that we should um, uh, bring out at this point? Uh, I just think um, really, um, I think we covered uh, everything that we wanted to cover as you stated. I, I think if a patient has pain in their knee that's going on for several weeks, um, that that should be uh, checked. I, I think Patients should be, uh, not be concerned that if they're going to an orthopedic surgeon for a knee problem, that that automatically means that they're going to need arthroscopic surgery. I think they need to understand that there are a lot of ways to treat these problems non-surgically, yet if surgery is indicated, it's a very safe, very reliable technique, uh, and that expectations have to be um, set on both ends in order to get an excellent result. Well, I think that's, that's a good wrap up and good, good information and advice for patients. So I wanna thank you for joining us today and invite you back anytime you would like to talk further about uh, any aspect of knee surgery. So thanks for joining us today. That would be terrific and I really thank e Orthopod for inviting me to uh, give this talk. Thank you. Thank you.